week's local marketing update is brought to you by Scott Gallagher. Scott is the co-founder of Local Marketing Source and has become the recognized expert in providing online marketing services to local businesses. Follow Scott on Twitter at Scott Gallagher 5 and on Facebook.com slash Scott P. Gallagher. Hey, well, good afternoon, everyone. Scott Gallagher here with Local Marketing Source for our weekly local industry update. And today, uh, we've got quite a bit to cover today for this week's update. And we got some good tips and uh, a few things going on in the, uh, the Facebook group. Study has come out and it finds that Google's Penguin update is getting stricter over time. Uh, essentially, this is coming from the percentage of negative links um, pointing to a particular page and we know that there's certain thresholds as to what type of spammy links a page can stand. Well, rather than just looking at this from a complete narrow sense that it is just a specific percentage, we do have to understand that maybe page rank of the domain name itself um, maybe authority within the authorship also play factors in the weight that a percentage of spam links can can be a website can ultimately withstand but we've got to make an assumption and and pick a number somewhere on the average of course with a variance uh, plus or minus but we're, we're looking to have the question answered as to what tolerance the average website can have in terms of spammy links and if you've done article marketing, especially with auto distribution software or used products like Traffic Geyser, you can bet your dollar that you've fired spammy links to that particular website. There's no question in that. It's not to say that all article marketing tactics are going to give you spammy links. And if you're marketing through eZine, for example, well, you're not going to have spammy links, especially if they're approving those, all those articles being sent. And so the study has... Um, taking a look at the top 50 websites on uh, Inc. 5000 list and it showed that 36 of the 50 really have less than 10 percent of their links coming from questionable sources well these guys are ranking very well so we know 10 percent is okay a fifth of the sites or 20 percent of the websites had had to be found between 11 and 40 percent of their links being spam and and so um, you know that's bringing us up to about 95 percent of all of all businesses that are out there that are, are currently ranking and so four of the websites had over 40 percent of their links and they still maintained some ranking well this these figures have changed over time and they measured that between april of 2012 and december of 2012 and that number and that percentage of links that had spammy links was 80 all the way back in april and so it appears that the threshold of Google Panda Penguin updates are now allowing somewhere around a 50% threshold. Well, I know that my sites could not sustain that. And so the figure lies somewhere between 20 and 50. But the question really becomes is to what is Google's tolerance for spam link going to be? Is it going to be 20% across the board or 5%? We don't know. And that's something we want to watch. Uh, again, with that, there was a uh, update that the SEO community has agreed upon, but Google has come out and said, we're not confirming it, and we're not going to probably be able to confirm any more updates. The reason is, is because their gradual rollout is, um, of Panda um, is, is rolled out right into their search bots on a real-time basis. And so we'll see things happen in real time as websites are being crawled. Uh, eBay has come out and said that AdWords is ineffective. This story is creating a lot of buzz and controversy in our industry. It's really cool because they're arguing that search engine marketing has little, little to no impact. It's worthless on traffic and sales, except in very marginal cases. Of course, Google is firing back and saying otherwise that you know they've got the figures and the data to prove otherwise. But eBay has actually published this and said that when it compares its paid search ads on its organic traffic and sales, the majority of their business comes directly from all of their organic listings, including words of branded keywords and um, 
short term and sorry long, short tail and long tail keywords basically cover the gamma of keywords another study that I found interesting is that 55 percent of mobile conversion driven websites for all types of local businesses that conversion happens within 60 minutes or less in other words that tells me as a marketer that mobile based websites have to have clear call to action to create communication to create that engagement and not fluffy engagement with social sites but direct engagement because a higher percentage of mobile searchers are or have commercial intent at least that's what this data is telling us this is a Google Nielsen study um, very reputable organizations both of them and they provided a great deal of data uh, they also said that 73 percent of mobile search searches trigger a follow-up action well that's that communication that engagement that connection and the ability to do that whether it's a click to call feature for Android devices or Skype um, easy to navigate and find phone numbers uh, maybe even have the ability to provide instant video conferencing. 63% of mobile searches triggered action within one hour of the initial search. 45% um, of mobile, mobile searches uh, are, are conducted to help make buying decisions. When in a store, and they do a particular search though, that that uh, jumps up to 66%. And at the end of the day, 28% of all searches, more than one quarter, one out of four searches results in a local conversion. One in four searches results in a local conversion. Now, for all the internet marketers on the line right now, that's an extremely important figure that you should probably drill in your head. You work things backwards. We know click-through rates. We know volume and we can make estimations with an educated guess as to volume of searches. And, and now, from a Google Nielsen report, one quarter of those searches are going to result in a particular uh, conversion. Well, when you're looking at a specific industry, we can even understand the value of a conversion. In other words, now with this number, this is the key number we've been waiting for, we can make clear estimations on market sizes. For example, I could turn around and with this data, I can now understand how much money is being spent in my zip code for attorney services. How big is that market? So what type of value can you associate to being in spot number one? What type of value can you associate to being spot number two? That gives us as internet marketers even another argument and a different way to be able to price our services. We can now price it based off of value entirely. And we could work through those numbers if you'd like, but I really have to move on. Um, so we've got some other tips to get on. Um, well, what's the time? You know, I, I did go through, I, I had quite a bit. I did fly through it a little bit faster. So uh, before I get into the tip, let's, let's just kind of work through that a little bit. Um, and I'm going to use a simple example like uh, pizza delivery, okay? And uh, I, could, I could do some research and figure out how many searches exist for a particular zip code for all the different combinations and permutations of trying to find pizza. That would be, you know, pizza, pizza delivery, um, maybe even some brand names um, for a particular geographical area. And let's assume that, you know, I'm just doing this off the top of my head, but let's assume that that's a thousand searches a month for a particular area. You know, we, knew go, we know Google's market share, so the data that they give us, you know, we've got to take market share into account, and they recognize seven, about 7%, 70%, excuse me. Once you know um, the number of searches, well, a pizza organization knows that uh, you know, their average order is going to be um, 30 bucks. And a quarter of those searches, well, we know that a click through rate for spot number one is going to be 25%. And so a business in spot number one is going to get about 250 hits. 
um, knowing that one quarter of those searches are going to result in a conversion, um, we're now looking at about what, like 62 purchases at an average sale price of 30 bucks. That's about 60 to $75 a day in potential revenue. Understanding that they're variable and, and, and uh, fixed costs, but their profit margins are going to be about 30%. You know, you're looking at about 30 or 40 bucks profit, pure profit after expenses per day. Multiply that by uh, 30 days, and that's about 900 to 1,000 dollars. And so the profit value of being in spot number one is $1,000 with that particular uh, scenario that I used. Of course, again, I'm just pulling numbers out of the air. Uh, we've always argued that pizza delivery companies are not the best organizations to go after. The numbers are just uh, small. I'm doing this all in my head. Uh, and don't have a calculator out. But if you started to look and work backwards, you know, I know that in the courier industry, for example, there's you know, a couple of thousand searches a month and the average orders are, you know, 200 and change. Um, but that's not even incorporating customer value over time. Um, so you could really have some fun with numbers. And I like numbers. All right. Well, that comes to the conclusion for this week's update. I'm now going to talk about a local internet marketing agency tip of under promise and over deliver. Well, that has always been Apple's or Steve Jobs' big secret, um, and it's a you know it it works in all facets of our life. You know whether it's a relationship that we get into, you know you start to over deliver uh, or over promise. Uh, it makes it very very easy to under deliver and and you just result in disappointment. So any relationship that you've ever had in your life. Um, whether it's with, I mean, kids watching relationships and relationship behavior with children. I, I've learned so much in business because of my kids and how they particularly behave. And if you, um, if you overpromise with kids, it doesn't matter what you deliver to them. They're going to be disappointed. <laughs> you know, you could be promising them to go to Six Flags in Texas to go see uh, Auntie May that you don't even want to see, but that falls through and take them to Six Flags and that, uh, two days in a row uh, in Chicago, and they're going to be disappointed. Um, it doesn't matter how you present it to them. It's, it's the fact that uh, when... When you take something away of something that's been promised, there's a sense of disappointment regardless. And so in business, if you ever make a particular promise and don't deliver, um, you've brought yourself further behind, in my opinion, than you were when you started out before you made that promise in the first place. And so it's it's tough in our business because a lot of our competitors are giving guarantees. You're going to get a guaranteed spot of this or a guaranteed spot of that. And if you don't set up expectations, um, one smart person told me once that I'll never forget that um, false expectations turns into disappointment. And it's our job to properly and clarify those expectations that we provide our clients. And at the end of the day, you know, they want to know numbers of sales. Well, that that really gets into some some scary areas if you're going to make promises. I just was talking about that, but you've got to really make it clear as to what you're demonstrating to the customer. And when you really want to under deliver, sorry, under promise, um you're going to know some of these metrics and you know we know that 28% convert well you're only going to use a conversion of 25% uh you know we know that um we could probably make a strong argument that there's 10,000 searches per month for a particular key word and all of its combinations and permutations but we're going to play with 50% of that. We're going to lower it a little bit. And of course, you've gone through all of these numbers before you speak with the customer and still know that it makes financial sense to them. 
And when you've demonstrated that at four or five different spots, you've devalued the conversion numbers a little bit. And you say, look, Mr. Customer, you know in even one of these little areas, it will increase this number. But even at this scenario, you're still going to get a positive return on investment. Other expectations to discuss are, of course, you know, people naturally assume that the higher they're ranked for their keywords, the more business they're going to get. That's true in a lot of situations. We know that. So those results, ranking results, are also expectations. And, you know, we, we tell... I, I, one of the things we'll tell clients is, you know, you've got to you've got to assume that it could take us up to six months to get these results. But it is our objective to try and work hard and get you a better ranking results in a shorter period of time. And when you come in at the third or the fourth month with results, they're happy. And so the time factor of expectations is important. And then finally reporting, and one thing that I've learned over the years, one big mistake I made for four to five years of, of having my agency, was what we reported to clients. And I really started to learn in 2006 when I was outsourcing, and the outsourcing people I was outsourcing to wouldn't tell me any of the strategies they were doing for SEO because it was proprietary rights. Well, it didn't take me long to realize that that was a big mistake, and and. It's not a shame to tell our customers what we do. As a matter of fact, we want to tell them what we're, what we're doing, everything that we're doing. And it's not a shame to do that. If you're doing your job right, you're going to give them a service that's worthy. And they're going to recognize that for $1,000 a month, they're getting their money's worth. And when you start talking about, you know, we, we captured 20 profiles, it takes, what, 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes of your time with emails for your uh, each profile once everything is said and done um, or somebody else's time for that matter and the video work that you create and the different pieces of content you create and where that's distributed you know there's a lot of work that's involved and so a report that says what you've done is also providing a tremendous amount of benefit to your customers when you've under promised and over delivered. All right, well, that comes to the, uh, to the conclusion of the tips as well. And I know that we had, uh, I've got a couple of questions here posted in the group. Um, and Scott, you know, I know you had your hand up and you were just saying, ah, sorry about that. My connection failed. If you do have a question, go ahead and raise your hand and we'll get you on there. Uh, Tish is asking, um, what were those three keywords again? I got Forbes and local, but the third one, the search. Well, first off, I noticed that the attendance rate is a lot higher than when we uh, when I first started right now. Uh, for those of you that missed that, that was a very important article that I suggest you go and read. Uh, it's an article from Forbes magazine. Um, and I suspect if you do just do a search for Forbes local and 2013, 2013, um, you're going to be able to find that article for Forbes. Go and read it. What the article is about is their take on what's going to happen in local 2013. And these are good things to know. I, I take a lot of pride in trying to understand where businesses are going and what's happening with an industry. And that ultimately just sets us up to be in a better position to help our customers. And Nick, what's Nick's asking? Please post a link to the data on Facebook. What data are you talking about, Nick? And where was I talking when you were asking? I'll assume you're typing right now. His GoToWebinar doesn't say. Nick Dale is typing. Like when you're sitting on an IM with somebody and then their thing stops because they erase it for a little bit, then they go grab a drink and you're still thinking that they're sitting there typing and you're sitting there waiting. That's why I hate having conversations on Facebook. I hate Facebook. It's like wrecking us.
wonder if Nick's still listening to us or if he is typing. Put your hand up, Nick, if you want to get on the line. I know sometimes you can and sometimes you can't. Uh, I'll just go through my notes. Please post links to that data on Facebook. I didn't scroll down. Nielsen and Google. So yeah, that was one of the studies. Man, I talked about a lot of studies today. There was a lot of different studies in my, uh, I guess, done over the last couple of weeks, huh? All right. So here's the content. Let me go find a digital copy of it and I'll post a link to it. And I'll just stay on the line with everybody right now while I'm posting that link just in case if there's any additional questions. All right, I got the info for you. I'm just going to Facebook right now. And there you go. Done and done. Catherine has got a question, and she says. What are some re good resources for collecting up-to-date information about websites? I'm going to be writing a download for our website page. What are some good resources for collecting up-to-date information about websites? I'm going to be writing a download for our, our web page. Hmm. I'm trying to get some clarity, Catherine. I don't quite understand. Um... First off, you know, what type of information, what type of up-to-date information about websites are you talking about? Are you talking about a bot that goes out and crawls particular websites? Or um, a strategy of utilizing a reader, like, well, we no longer have Google Reader or an RSS reader. If you don't know what RSS is, that may, might be an answer to your question. That's short form for, I think, real simple syndication. It's just basically a way to read websites. So I don't have to go to a whole bunch of websites to read them. I just have a reader to collect the newest information. Um, that might be a solution. You can have uh, on websites, um, you can install a, uh, a WordPress plugin that goes and reads different RSS feeds from a whole variety of different websites and have it reproduced on your own web page. So you let me know if that's helping you uh, in the direction or if I need some further clarity. Um, and I also don't know what you mean about writing a download. You're going to be writing a download for your website page. I don't know what you mean by that. Uh, Scott says, just happy to be finally be able to join you guys again. It's a uh, long time coming. Um, that's great to hear, Scott. Uh, I appreciate it. It's nice to have you on the line. Um, it's nice to have some of your participation into the Facebook group and, and asking some of your uh, questions. Um, we're not a big family at Local Marketing Source, but we, uh, you know, between the 30 or so of us, um, we're, we're a happy family. And we've got, uh, we have a lot of fun and um, doing well. I mean, the, the one thing is about Local Marketing Source, now that we've changed the way we operate, we're much more member, 
associated as opposed to, you know, you come in and you buy a product and you learn on your own. Um, active members of local marketing source uh, all seem to have successful businesses. It's really, really cool. Um, you know, I could just imagine having everybody into one room and what that would be like. You know, we all have similar businesses and every one of us have a story behind us on how, how we got into this. A lot of us, this is, uh, would have been your first, well, I, my agency was my first real, real business. I mean, 17 years old, I had a lawn cutting business and employed all my friends, but, you know, we just drank uh, all the profits away. Um, so it'd be really neat. There's a lot of really, really cool stories. A lot of jobs that have been quit and a lot of families uh, that have changed because of local marketing source. It's pretty cool. So yeah, we're really happy to have you back. So Catherine's saying uh, that she needs to clarify. So I'm going to assume that she's sitting there typing away and clarifying. And I'll remember to scroll down just like Nick uh, said. Tisha, um, same thing. She's just speaking up and saying some nice stuff about local marketing source, and she appreciates LMS. Scott, know that yeah, we. I do. It's. Uh, I have the most fun on Wednesdays. You know, Wednesdays are my favorite day. Uh, I can see Catherine's got her hand up right now, so I could probably go on a whole tangent as to why I like Wednesdays and. You know, I spend my time putting all the call together and all the tips and all of that and then recording it. And I do all the video editing myself. Um, don't have a video editor on staff. I just enjoy doing it. It's not that hard. And then uh, propagate it. And it's just, it's just a lot of fun. And again, you know, I just want to tell a quick little story here because it really reminded me a lot of something that I predicate, and I, I saw it in action wholeheartedly. Catherine, I'm going to be right to you, because I think this is a really good story. It's about my buddy. Uh, he just sold his hot dog restaurant, you know. Um, he, he sold it for, I don't know, 40 or 50 grand. Um, not very, you know, not, not very much money, but it's a small little, a small little restaurant. And the guy that bought it um, paid cash for it. Never ran a restaurant before in his life. It wasn't his money. It was family money that was given. And a lot, you know, shit started to hit the fan a little bit because this is a small little restaurant. It wasn't, it was a restaurant that was built entirely off of passion, okay? It, you know, the guy, I remember when he first started three or four years ago, he, his rent was $400 a month in this real, real shitty place and he had no money. And he was working, you know, 80 hours a week and he kept trying to do, you know, different types of hamburgers with fresh ground meat and fresh cut French fries and real, real fresh you know, uh, types of foods, but in a fast food type of setting and trying all these different things. And he made it. Uh, he made himself a staple uh, sandwich that has really been now, you know, known around Chicago and around the local area and built himself a really, really solid clientele. But he's in a really shitty area where a lot of restaurants have turned over. A really, really bad economy in the last four years. Um, his All his odds were stacked up against him, but he survived because he was passionate about what he did. And I think that's a lesson he's learning. I think that's a lesson that we, him and I are both seeing from, from his situation. And this new guy comes in and buys. Now he's running the same restaurant, but from a different philosophy, from a different perspective. He's running it like a business, um, like a business-minded individual, not from a passionate of you know, developing this. He introduces uh, items like frozen, frozen fish, um, you know, has changed hot dogs, and you know, my own employee has told me he's not going there because he just doesn't like the hot dogs. I don't understand how you can screw hot dogs up, but you know, they managed to do it. And uh, you know, there was a post on his Facebook group last night that somebody said, um, some customer said, "We're not coming back. We went twice since the new management came into place." And the new manager was sitting there on his stool while the other guy, which is the original employee, was cooking away and doing all the work. And it took twice as long to get the food. And they don't know what teamwork is over there. And so the point being is, is the mentality of this individual of walking in with a business mind and making sure that, you know, everybody knows about him on Facebook and he's doing some of his marketing and he's making sure that the restaurant is much cleaner than it was. It looks a lot more professional. 
Um, he's using different types of branding, you know, working in the back and spending money, but forgetting about the business itself, forgetting about the people aspects of it and the, the passion of it. And I don't think any business, I don't think anybody on the phone right now is going to survive without being passionate for their customers and having that genuine want to be able to get them to be successful. Not sure why I went on that tangent. I think there was another point, but it was uh, it's just a good story that I've come across and really wanted you uh, you guys to hear it. So uh, with that, um, Scott typed in another question. Catherine had her hand up first. Um, I will unmute you, Catherine. And if you want to, uh, you should be unmuted now. So go ahead. Are you there? I am. Hi. Hiya. How are you? Pretty good. I haven't been around for a while. We've been so busy that I haven't been able to make the calls. But I raced home today and got on late, but here I am. <laughs> well, that's what I was just going to say. It's nice to hear your voice and nice to hear you're on the calls. I noticed you haven't been around. and Last week, I don't know what happened. I think there was a screw-up because somebody uh, complained, rightfully complained. Um, but I had nobody on a call last week, and normally we have at least a third of our members. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Something must have gone wrong. It was my fault after we figured it all out. I well, started the, wrong, the no, wrong webinar. Nothing's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> my question from earlier was, um, what's happening in our agency is that we have a pretty strong demand for website development, design, and on some occasions, rebranding. So we're running this pay-per-click campaign, and the download that we have on our website just isn't, you know, it's, it's basically, you know, marketing tips. So my question to you was, are there any good, really, any resources that I can go to to be able to write and find some really valuable information? Not sure exactly what to tell you what's going to be in the content yet, but I want it to be based on, you know, the average person, the average business owner that can receive some value from this download, talking about the importance of, you know, a strong presence online, um, features that a website has to have because we're running into things people don't really understand that, you know, there are certain specific pages that a website has yeah. to have, and just things like that. Yeah, so I know I where you're going with that. And this is this is a discussion, a brainstorming session that we could talk for a couple of hours if we wanted to. Um, I put yeah. a lot of thought to, to what you were talking about. And, you know, there's a couple of points that I want to point out first before we, we talk about a couple of solutions. Um, you know, but first off, to, I'm not sure if you're entirely clear and I can provide some of my own opinion as to what our objectives are. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, our objective really... I mean, we're, we're building a business. We want clients, right? But, but before, right. you know, we know that a website is not going to get them into the sales cycle, but at least it will generate leads. And, and so we want to generate a lead from anything that we're doing on our website, really. And, you know, to, to generate leads, um, you know, we've got different ways of doing that, of building relationships and, you know, providing value and, um, you know, so, but we do hope that there's some form of call to action on those websites. So you, you know, that, that's something that you you definitely want clear is that the information that you're going to provide is going to get them into some sort of call to action. Yes. Um, depending on how your business is set up, that call to action might be to attend a webinar, might be to opt in onto an email autoresponder. It might be to give you a phone call, um, and set up an appointment or to send you an email. Uh, but one one way or another, depending on the different sales channels that you are your favorites or you've got set up, uh, your call to action should should definitely parallel that. Now, with that call to action, that is also going to define some sort of content that you know uh, we want to be able to have on there. Um, you know, I, you, you might be thinking, okay, of different websites that have different types of information, you know, third party information. You may be thinking that for credibility purposes. You may be thinking that for ease of creating secondary content purposes. It might be a combination of, of both. Um, you know, when we can show a customer or a consumer, a potential buyer, that Nielsen Research said that, you know, these are certain percentages um, 
you know, there, there's going to be some merit to those percentages as opposed to, you know, just us pulling it out of the air. The other question, you know, becomes is, okay, you know, I've thought about the approach of, well, let's do a webinar and tell them everything I know. Let me treat local business owners like I treat LMS students. And let me start to show them exactly how to do things. Well, that didn't work so hard, well because it, it really just completely scared people off. And the amount of information that I had to demonstrate and show to, to get to that level, it just bored people away. That's not what local business owners are really looking for. And understanding that our target audience are local business owners, the tonality on that page should be specifically clear that you're a local business owner and not an employee of a local business. You're a final decision maker. And the items that are important to them are going to be uh, items like the metrics. You know, what's important to them is, is business and sales. So how many sales can they particularly get? So there's certain metrics that you may want to demonstrate. Um, in, in almost all of these cases, regardless of your sales channel cycle, certain metrics are, are important. Rankings and click-through rates for the top two or top three rankings are very good. There's a very general misconception that being on the first page is good. It's not. Maybe this last study that I talked about um, regarding, or that PDF, sorry, that PDF that eBay just put out. eBay is a big, reputable company, and they're saying that paid advertising through Google just sucks. You know, to demonstrate, okay, so now that we know click-through rates of one and two and three are very important, we know that organic is very, very important. Maybe an item of authorship or, or video content, a video snippet to show a, you know, a site like that. You can also, um, you can also highlight that those sources by providing links back to them for credibility. You may want to take that to a different level and turn that into an infographic. I don't know if you're familiar with infographics or not. Are you? Yes. Yes, I am. You know, you can get them designed on fiber um, for, for pretty cheap. And there's no infographics that I've come across that really show, you know, something that's being shared among business communities. I'd love to see an infographic created and just having your, you know, your logo on the bottom. But that infographic will also show very well on a particular page. So you may want to think around that, that, that concept as, as well. Um, and then finally, when I said that I, uh, you know, provided too much education on the how-to um, my sales webinar that I provide local businesses demonstrates the correlation. You know that light bulb moment uh, that most local marketing source students have uh, at some point in time that, hey, SEO is really just marketing. And good SEO is really just good marketing. And demonstrating that and when you know, when I go through my sales pitch with potential prospects, I know that I can tell when they get it. You know, if I'm if I'm there in person, it's really easy because that's when they start nodding their head. You know, or I can hear the the size on on the telephone. But when they get it, that's when I start talking about okay, what do we do? You know, what what do you need to do? What's important that's out there? You know, showing an example of. Um, testimonial or a write-up that you have in the local chamber of commerce or something of that nature so that's you know that's the last piece of the puzzle <sighs> that was a lot Did, does that help at all do you have any further <laughs> questions to that actually yes it does help um, and I think the infographic we've, we've actually been working on some infographics for our plumber client that we're finishing up so yeah, I think that's a really good idea. I'm going to put some thought into all those things you said and try to come up with something in the next week or so. I really think that um, creating creating info like this exact infographic that we're talking about, I've been putting a lot of thought to this over the last couple of weeks, actually, and I really think that it's if if we can create you know create them for specific industries, you know, for me for the transportation industry, we've created a couple. It's going to be those infographics that get passed around internally within that industry. Every industry, yeah. people know people know other people in their field, you know? Mm -hmm. Dentists know dentists, and it's going to get shared one to another to his other buddy, and 
Um, I think I think that's the trick to get some of our content to go viral. Well, and you know what's interesting? I know you always call Pinterest the shiny object, but there are some really fantastic infographics inside Pinterest, and yeah. um, they definitely get passed around. I can tell you that much. Well, I think I think. Infographics on itself, I think, are some of the new, is, is the shiny object <laughs> to a certain degree. Yeah. Um, I, I do think that infographics are, are just a fad. I mean, the idea of, it's, it's really marketing. It's kind of funny that it's got a whole new name to it and whatnot. They've existed for a long time, and it just seems to be some people are catching on and going, oh, this is the new great thing. But on the other side of it, though, consumers are really gobbling them up on social networks. Yes. Like they never have before. So. Well, thank you for that. Good. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and mute you and get the Scott's question here.